We heard a lot last night in those wonderful acts of storytelling about the need as journalists to get the details right, get the facts right on a story, and that, that's absolutely right. There's another big responsibility we all have, and that's about understanding the context of the facts that we're reporting. And I feel that especially as, as, a, as a foreign journalist with the BBC for many years. If I think of some of the places I've worked over the years, even reporting a simple act like the security forces arresting someone, the context could be very different if that's in West Berlin or East Berlin, in West, Berlin, in West Jerusalem or East Jerusalem, even on my last posting in Northwest Washington, D.C. or Southeast Washington, D.C. So it's one of the reasons I'm particularly looking forward to um, our next speaker this evening. Uh, Professor Sheila Jasanoff um, has spent much of her career studying exactly this kind of context, but in her own specialist field of science and technology studies. Uh, she's produced a wealth of pioneering research about the role of science and technology in modern democracies around the globe, many of which, like a good academic, a good scientist, uh, even a good reporter, she has visited, lived in, and written about at length. Now, I know that many Niemans, I know that there's even at least one of them here today have uh, taken Sheila's classes over the years and have said they are amongst the most influ influential that they uh, spent time with. Um, I'm also reliably informed that if you are left intellectually dissatisfied at the end of this wonderful morning, that I know Sheila will be happy to talk you through another of her specialist subjects, the structure of medieval Bengali languages. <laughs> So, ladies and gentlemen, our next speaker, Professor Sheila Jasanov. Thank you, Simon, for that introduction. And it's a real rare treat to be with all of you uh, here this morning. It actually is morning, Simon, and not evening. Uh, <laughs> I know in a room like this, it's hard to keep track. Uh, but my own first introduction to the Neiman Fellowship Program was when I took First Amendment Law with Tony Lewis. And so uh, it's been a part of my life, and I read the work that all of you produce on a, well, at least a sample of it, on a semi-regular basis. And, um, of course, it's also a special treat to hear from our colleagues this morning, whom we don't hear enough of um, from being in our cloistered places at Harvard. So uh, one, of the, uh, one of the thoughts I had was that I'm going to be talking about innovation because it's a buzzword in science and technology these days. Wherever one goes, one hears about innovation. And in fact, I was interested to see that on your program later tomorrow or later today, you have innovations in storytelling, whereas I'm going to be talking about storytelling about innovation. So without knowing that I was going to reverse the real I already had it all planned out. And I'm going to reverse the reel in another way that also was unplanned because I'm going to suggest that innovation, in a way, reverses the kind of proce process that Jill Lepore was talking about earlier this morning. Jill mentioned going from mystery to uh, secrecy to privacy, but what was elided there was that between the secrecy and the privacy, there was publicness, and then came the privacy. So I'm going to suggest that innovation, in the way that it's usually talked about by some of you in this room, uh, goes from things that are actually public and lying around ready to hand, making them secret, and eventually making them mysterious. So it's a process of turning the, the wheel of science backward, in a sense, and taking some things that could have been easily in the public domain, but making them as if mysterious. And this is something that I think we ought to resist in the name of the kind of citizenship that Ethan was talking about a moment ago. So let me talk about some of these back stories. We think about creativity, we think about moments of innovation as being flashes, flashes of genius, bursts of creation, and here's one such story. It is the report in Nature magazine in 1997 of the birth of the sheep Dolly. Um, and the image is interesting because it suggests you know, this 
things stepping out of a petri dish, life created out of scientific instruments. But if you're into images, as I'm sure many of you are, you may think of some of the other connotations here. Why the circular image connoting a planetary backdrop? Why the particular stepping out of Dolly's legs from out of the circle? I'm reminded of that image of William Blake uh, showing God creating the earth. And, and it's, uh, uh, there's somehow latent in the imagery itself a notion that this is a first moment. There was nothing behind it. It burst forth as if out of nowhere. So if you think about context, as Simon suggested correctly, I do, you know that that's made up that behind every innovation is a genealogy, a history, waiting to be excavated. And that genealogy, in the case of the birth of Dolly the sheep, includes fiction. It includes one of the very first stories about human beings creating novel forms of life. It includes stories about industrialization of those processes of creating novel forms of life and we're all familiar with Brave New World, also many of us are familiar with the human reproductive techniques that to some extent predated the cloning of Dolly the sheep. But one reason all of us immediately became so concerned about the ethical implications of Dolly was that we already were primed to think about ethical issues when reproduction had been taken out of the womb and into the test tube 20 years before the birth of Dolly. There was a very influential ethics report that to this day lays down the foundations for the ways in which we think about how to deal with innovation in the realm of uh, reproductive technologies. And in Britain, but not in America, an entire new regulatory structure was developed that predated by a number of years the birth of Dolly. And interestingly, even the birth of Dolly was, in a sense, not the birth of Dolly, because it was reported a full seven months later, an odd way to celebrate a novel birth. And it illustrates, I think, in micro form, the ways in which behind the alleged innovation is an entire history of obfuscation and secrecy making, if you will, so that the moment of innovation becomes a kind of mystery to us instead of seeming like a progression that was caused by human beings through human institutions and through kinds of work being done that bring particular modes of innovation to light. So it's not only the historical progression that brings us to that burst of creativity that we tend to forget, but we also make up the needs that innovation is supposed to serve. And I was interested to find in the New York Times this past summer, just a month or so ago, a new burst of writing about a product of genetic engineering in the agricultural domain that's been with us as a story for a very long time. So I think it was more than 10 years ago that Time magazine had this cover story, this rice could save a million kids a year. And then fast forward, or not so fast forward, 10 or 11 years, and we get golden rice, a lifesaver or lifesaver. Um, and so what's, what's going on here? I mean, first of all, if it's an innovation, then we shouldn't actually be coming back to whether or not it's a lifesaver and how many millions we're saving sort of decades apart. But to me, there's something else going on here. So whose lives are we saving and where do we get the million figure from? We have to create the million. In a sense, the innovators depend on a prior creation of a world of millions of people who are dependent on that particular innovation in order to be suckered then by the findings of science. So back in, the, in 1992 or in the 1990s, I came across this rather extraordinary image of an entire continent at need of being rescued by science and technology. And it was actually called, this cartoon was called Africa Begging. And this is why, Ethan, I'm a little bit 
suspicious to some extent about the ways in which global news is delivered because it does matter. The format matters and how one casts the rest of the world matters as well. But it's not just public and popular journalism. That is, one can dismiss this image as, well, it couldn't happen in America. We wouldn't be telling this particular story or, or whatever. But I was interested to find in Science Magazine not so long ago, ten, again, about 10 years ago, a rather strange article. So this was by the then director of the Rockefeller Foundation, which has been an enormous supporter of the development of agricultural biotechnology. And the story was about why agricultural bio biotechnology is profoundly needed in Africa. But this is Science Magazine, leading science journal, one of two, along with Nature, in the entire universe, as far as we know. And it is about a fictional character. So you don't think of Science Magazine as a place where fictions are being created. But Conway and Tunison actually write, we will refer to Mrs. We will refer to Mrs. Namoronda. The quotations are theirs, who represents a composite of situations existing in Africa. And then the whole purpose of the technology is to serve this composite person. The language in which this composite lady is then talked about reminds us of the plagues of Egypt. Because Mrs. Namurunda, we find, had a cassava crop that was devastated by cassava mealybugs. Her banana seedlings were infected with weevils. Her beans suffered from fungal diseases that shriveled pods. And more often than not, she faced a drought during the growing season. So all of these problems are there to be solved through the development of agricultural biotechnology, which, however, takes a very long time to germinate, as we see from the story of golden rice, which is an ongoing story, not at an end yet. And so one of the things that we should keep in mind is that in order to produce innovation, we have to create the, somehow the group of people who are going to be benefited. And the characterizations of those people are not always the ones that lead to the greatest civic involvement by the very people whose problems innovation is intended to serve. So contrast something else. Contrast innovators who are rarely put on the same page as innovators in science and technology. And yet, arguably, these innovators have had at least as much impact on the lives of people in the modern world, in the contemporary world, as the ones who are innovating in science and technology. So I want to suggest, and I want to leave with this thought, that, and this, I think, echoes a message that you just heard from Ethan about journalism in general, that there is a mode of innovation that begins with the people being served by the innovation. And unlike that image of Africa, this other mode of innovation begins with an assumption not of neediness, not of distress, not of poverty, not of hunger, not of begging, but of competence. So what did these innovators, whose images I showed you in the previous slide, and some others that I will throw in for fun, assume about competence. Gandhi built a, an entire movement on the basis that individuals in a still colonial country were capable of political competence. Martin Luther King built a movement on the basis that people who had been denied the vote in many cases were capable of civic competence. Muhammad Yunus built an entire new approach to finance and banking on the theory that very ordinary people are capable at a micro scale of economic competence. J.K. Rowling has assumed that children are capable of imaginative competence. Tim Berners-Lee assumed a world in which people will share information and have a kind of competence to do that. And Mark Zuckerberg left Harvard because he believed that networking competence that he would build in other ways would give him a better education <laughs> than all of us are capable of providing. <laughs> so, so I think innovation needs to be celebrated in all of its forms. And I think the stories we need to tell about innovation have to be more complex, more critical, 
and above all, more comprehending. Thank you.